welcome back to the Atlas Studios development blog. First off, I want to have a massive welcome to Jinx, our new artist who will be working with us for the next few months. I want to send out a massive thank you to our backers who have made this possible and we've been able to grow our team because of the Kickstarter support. Our Steam public demo is back on Steam and live, so if you haven't played it already, make sure you go check that out. And if you want to see the new features, those are all out there as well. So diving into what we've been doing, we've got this test scene that you can see me making in the background. We've been testing our new foliage made by Jinx in her first week. We've been doing this to diversify the shape and sizes of our foliage so we can create some more interesting uh, dynamic environments. What do you think of this so far? And would you like to see a video of us breaking down how we make our highly dynamic foliage and how we build our foliage actors up from the ground up? That's what I really want to talk about with the new foliage. You'll be able to see it in the game in the next week or so. A staple of the vlog, of course, is us talking about our saving and loading. It now works mostly, which is very exciting. A massive thanks to our testers who have been really helping us with finding bugs, um, giving feedback on our Discord. There are still some features to add, such as um, checkpoints, loading saves rather than predefined states, autosave functions, so if the game crashes or if there are any issues and you force quit, you have sort of autosaves to go back to, and lastly, save slots, so if you want to try different potions or different loadouts, you can make different um, playthroughs. But with saving and loading, it's pretty much all good news and we're moving on and giving the testers some time to come up with more bugs and feedback for us. So this is what I want to talk about mostly in this video. Um, and this is our new 3D UI solution. We decided to change up the UI because we wanted it to have a more adventure feel and for players to be able to interact with the adventure elements and exploration elements of the game more actively. Um, and we felt like mainly the quest system could be really in heightened um, with a system like this compared to 2D UI. So let's see what it was before. Before we just had this simple 2D UI um, which had you know tabs which showed you all the same information. There are some scaling and you know issues with it now because we've converted lots of the functionality. But this is what it was before just so you can have sort of an idea. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about mostly in this video today. Um, it's how we converted our UI into this 3D setup, um, the issues we encountered and such. So first up, let's talk about the specific blueprints we made to control the journal and the compass. So the journal is a very simple blueprint, which is this book, which has two UI planes, um, which you can see up here on either side, uh, showing the left and right page. This allows you know opening and closing the book. If it's at an angle, the UI shows up correctly, all that sort of stuff. One of the main jobs of this was converting the single plane UI into two planes. The event graph is very simple, it's just setting some references in the widget blueprint here um, and here as well, just setting some references so everything can talk to each other and communicate. The next one is the compass, which is even simpler. It is set up as two meshes so it can be dynamic, so we have the base mesh which you hold and then the compass section which spins. How we do the compass spinning is very simple, it is literally just this. Um, if you want to copy this, you know, feel free. Uh, it's not difficult at all. Uh, we're just getting the world rotation of the, you know, the character and then facing it in a certain direction. I'm very bad at math, so this took me way too long to figure out how to do. I had much more complicated systems, but Harry helped me out and just helped, told me, you're being stupid, Tom. Uh, there's a very simple solution to this, and this is it. Um, so thank you, Harry. As I mentioned, one of the main jobs in doing this was converting the single canvas 2D UI which had all of this information on one page, uh, both this stuff over here and this stuff, converting that into two separate pages, uh, the left and the right, uh, which spoke to each other and communicated. That was sort of one of the main jobs. The way I went about doing this was um, originally I just started duplicate, I just started from scratch and trying to remake the whole UI. And after about 20, 30 minutes of doing this, I realized I was being a fool, a fool I say, um, and what I should be doing is duplicating and just editing the functionality. So as you can see, the, the sort of what's on the right page over here and what's on the left page are on both of the elements. That's because they're both duplicated. Um, it's just I told them to now talk to each other rather than themselves. So when you press on a quest in the expedition tab, rather than spawning the information here, it now spawns the information on the other page. And that's sort of how I went about doing that. The one interesting thing you'll notice probably about this is this text that's kind of ugly here, um, that's because the way that Unreal renders UI 
um, is that in the world rendering it, if you don't have a stroke, it will disappear very quickly. The thin lines will get sort of rendered out. So by putting one outline and having it as the same color, it just bolds up that text a bit and helps the, the engine realize what it should be rendering and rendering it clearly so it's readable. Now let's move on to the spawning of these objects and moving them. So spawning them was quite simple. You get the mesh, you find a socket that you set up, I had to do some uh, rotation stuff with the uh, with the journal, but that's totally fine. Um, if you were doing a similar system, if you set it up correctly, you wouldn't have to bother doing this. Passing through some information, um, this is so the menu will open on the correct tab and show the correct information if you've already opened it up and looked at stuff before, um, as well as spawning the compass, which is just spawning it, setting up the rotation. Moving them between the hands was very easy. Uh, this was done through animation um, uh, blueprint events uh, through anim notifies. So we just have some events that change some integers um, and those change things on the animation blueprint. Some tips when it comes to sockets. So with setting up sockets on your skeletal meshes, this can be really annoying sometimes, you know, it's very finicky to you know, get in there and change stuff and you never really know if it's looking correctly and you just have to test it out and you end up moving it a million times and it's just not very not very efficient two quick tips to really help you with that firstly up here on the top right you can add a preview animation so let's say we're doing the journal pose we can just search journal edric journal pose one and you can now see that animation in its first frame and it'll help you position stuff however this doesn't help that much because you can't see the meshes yet so for that over here you can't add blueprints but you can add a preview asset. So let's here put compass and put our compass body. The scaling seems off on it. I uh, don't know why that is. Hmm, interesting. But normally you should just be able to place that in there and be able to see that working. It's really helpful for setting up the rotation and position of things um, so that it's all clear and easy to read. And after all that, it didn't work. Of course, there was something else we were missing. So the last thing I'm going to show you is really the core of making 3D UI. Because it's being spawned into the world and the widget is a widget component rather than just a widget being put on the screen, the player can't click on it. Even if you stopped movement, sport, showed the mouse and did all this other stuff. Editor Tom here, don't forget to set input mode game and UI. The player could not click on any of the buttons, could not interact with any of the scroll boxes, any of the anything. And um, they could see it, but they couldn't interact with it. And the UI you need to be able to interact with and change stuff. So the way I found out doing it, which apparently is very standard, uh, but I didn't know about it before, is this widget interaction component, which we added on to the blueprint for Edric's self, the, uh, the character blueprint. But that wasn't all. So once you've got this, what you need to make sure you do is set up these events, which allow you to set certain elements. So if you want to be able to press things, you need to set up this one. For left mouse button, press pointer key is your key node. And for scroll boxes, you want to be able to set up the scroll wheel. The only thing I haven't been able to set up so far is sliders. So on the settings, you need to be able to, you need to, be able to slide those sliders. You can still click and move them, um, but it's not quite as satisfying or as easy to use. But this wasn't the only step. So the other step is on the controller, you then need to set up on the actual input. So here, this is a custom event, which is wheel up, wheel down, press pointer and release pointer, which is fine. These, these events work. However, just having the input here didn't work. We wouldn't register any of the input. So what we found out we had to do is on the controller, have the input itself. So the actual mouse down, mouse up, left mouse button pressed, having those call those events from Edric. And just like how having these inputs on Edric didn't work, having these nodes and the widget interaction on the controller didn't work. So this is quite a specific setup and it was just, you know, 30 minutes of testing different orientations of these nodes. Because once you found the nodes you need with blueprints, it's just about testing them until you get the result you want. And so that's how we did the interaction. And that is how we got to this stage um, with this new 3D UI. There's still some improvements to be made with everything, mainly adding the final meshes, there are still some issues with the UI. Uh, there's this sort of glowy nature to the white. And finding a way to counteract that in the 3D UI will be important for us. We need to improve the animations um, and we need to improve the input. Right now there's two buttons. One bring it to your face and one put it into your hand. And if you press either of those, they put them away. 
this is fine we think but there's definitely better ways of doing this uh, and like with Elpin we need to iterate test things out and see how people like playing it. If you have any more feedback on this uh, new UI if you have any ideas of how we can improve it please don't hesitate to leave comments below or contact us on our discord we really appreciate all the feedback from testers and opinions of people so if you want to be more involved in the process please be vocal on those platforms. If you do want a more detailed step-by-step -step breakdown on how to do something like this let us know in the comments below and we'll make one. And that was everything. I want to say a massive thank you to all of our backers for their support and their feedback through our discord. If you want to try the game out yourself as I said at the beginning there's a live demo on Steam right now there'll be a link down in the description below. Make sure you wishlist it if you enjoyed that demo, it really does help us out. If you want to talk to us and give more feedback or talk to us about how we do things, join our Discord in the link below. If you have specific questions, go there or just ask in the comments um, on YouTube. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed. I'll see you next time, have a lovely rest of your day.